Welcome to today. This is our service at Tea Gardens Baptist Church. Today is known as Palm Sunday. It's a reminder of the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem with loving worshippers, casting palms before him, and yet days later he was crucified and despised by the same crowds. Easter Sunday has always been the high point for Christians. Resurrection is that grand celebration that brings eternal hope, but often with little or no attention to the significant events in Jesus' life that put him on the cross. The opportunity to reflect upon Christ's journey toward Jerusalem and the realisation of the fickleness of mankind places special significance on Christ's death and resurrection as one of total sacrifice for an unloving world. In order to get the joy of an empty tomb, the cross must be engaged. The fickleness of Palm Sunday reminds me that God will have the final word in our lives, not evil, and that word will be good. Today is our second live streaming service from individual homes. And whilst we are still learning, we hope that you are able to enjoy the service today. It is appropriate to realise that despite all the restrictions placed on us, God loves us and is doing a mighty work amongst us. The testimonies that I have received during the week about how God is changing and blessing lives I have never experienced before. Although we are separate, we are together under God. As we approach Easter, let us not take our eyes off the death and resurrection of Jesus, which gave us eternal life. We look forward to continuing the celebration of Easter with our services on Good Friday at 9am and Easter Sunday at 10am. Shall we sing together the new the new doxology led by Leonie Kuypert. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let earth and heavenly saints proclaim the power and might of his great name. Let us exalt on bended knee. Praise God, the Holy Trinity. Praise God, praise God, praise God who saved my soul. Praise God, praise God, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise to the King, his throne transcends, his crown and kingdom never ends. Now and throughout eternity, I praise the one who died for me. Praise God, praise God, praise God who saved my soul. Praise God, praise God, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, praise God. Praise God who saved my soul. Praise God, praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Thank you, Laiani. Let's not neglect the importance of prayer and thanksgiving. 
take time to pray and consider how we can see God working in our lives. Radio Rima is calling on all of us to pray for our emergency situation every night at 7 p.m. Let us join this call to prayer. We are looking at ways to establish virtual prayer meetings during the week. Have you thought of hosting such a group? In this time, we need to be a praying church more than ever. Ray will now lead us in prayer. Dear Lord, we praise you for being the great and wonderful God that you are. As Len has said, Lord, we do come separately, but as one. And you see us all, even in our different homes, as being one congregation. Please forgive us for our many failings. And indeed, we have many. May we simply repent of those, put it into our mind to do so. But we give you thanks, O oh Lord, for safekeeping so far. We turn now, Lord, to our missionaries and Christians in the world in danger. For those who serve or live in those far-flung places, they are in danger. Please safeguard them. Bless our overseas missionaries in particular and their families. Bless the health workers everywhere as they struggle right now to contain the virus. Keep them safe, Lord, we pray. And despite these present difficulties, which we all know fully about, may you be glorified. And finally, dear Lord, may the gospel be spread to all throughout the world. And this we ask today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you, Ray. Prayer is so vital and important. We have been going through a psalm a week. We have been doing this for over two years. So sit back and reflect on what the psalmist says to us. It's a timely reminder that God is in control. Right now, Caroline will read from Psalm 110. Thank you, Caroline. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendour, your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. Thank you, Caroline. Right now, um, we're going to have a special time for the children with Carolyn and David Boy. Over to you, Carolyn and David. Good morning, boys and girls. We're missing you a lot, but we keep praying for you that the Lord will protect you. Now, who likes to eat cake? I'm sure we all do. Yummy, yummy, yummy. But my favourite is chocolate cake. I wonder what yours is. So what is a chocolate cake made of? Flour, sugar, eggs, cocoa? Well, just like ch chocolate cake tastes good, shouldn't all those things taste nice too? Just to prove it, David is going to taste some cocoa. <laughs> Wasn't that nice? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think he—I don't think he really thought it was nice. He's grimacing here. Now, life can be a lot, like like the things that go into a cake. On their own, they may not taste nice. 
and life can be like that too. This little girl at the top is screaming her head off. I think she's going to have to have a nasty needle from a doctor. And the little boy on the right looks as though he's been injured and he's very sick in hospital. I'm sure you all know what it's like to fall off your bike or to fall over. Oh, ouch, it always hurts. And this little girl with the oxygen mask on is very sick. And that reminds me of this terrible virus and that's the way why we can't meet together. And so many people are going through these terrible times. But when we make a cake, we mix everything and put it in the oven. There it gets very hot and it might seem very painful, but that's how the cake cooks. And at the end, we have a delicious treat to eat. Mm -hmm. I bags a teddy bear on the top. And so God is able to blend all the good, bad, bad, good things and the bad things in our life together. And it's all for our good. And all together, they create a life that's meaningful, useful and tasty. It's very important that each one of us puts our lives in God's hands and know this beautiful result that David's going to read for us. God causes all things to work together good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Won't it be nice when we can all eat some cake together? But until then, remember that God is good and he cares for each one of you. Thanks, Carol, Carolyn and David. I only wish I could have had that cake, but at least I can do the colouring in. As we lead into communion, have your bread and drink ready. We will sing Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Saviour, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Saviour, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Saviour, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His 
mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Have you ever wondered why Christians eat a small piece of bread and drink a sip of wine or grape juice? In some, in some church services, for thousands of years, the church has continued to practice this particular aspect called communion, or depending on different church traditions, the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. Communion uses bread as a symbol for Jesus' body and wine as a symbol for his blood. Jesus started the tradition of communion. He instructed his followers to use bread and, and wine to remember the sacrifice he was going to make when he died for our sins on the cross. Jesus called himself the bread of life, which means that we're nourished by him. We survive because of him. And he satisfies us when everything else leaves us empty. There's a connection between our nearness to Jesus, believing in him and being fulfilled by him. The early church celebrated Jesus by taking communion. Sometimes every day, they saw that every time they gathered around a table to eat and drink, it was a chance to recognize Jesus and thank God for all he's done. Taking communion doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't save your soul or get you to heaven. God actually warns us about taking communion without considering what it means and why we're doing it. The intent is not for us to mindlessly perform a ritual, but to intentionally set aside time to remember what Jesus has done and why he did it. Every time we gather around bread and wine in church or in our homes, we remember Jesus is the one who provides all we need. It's not about the bread and wine. It's about the body and blood of Jesus. It's not about the ritual or the method. It's about listening to Jesus and doing what he says. Communion is not an obligation, but a celebration. Communion celebrates the gospel. Jesus was broken for us so that we can be fixed by him. Celebrating communion marks the story of Jesus, how he gave himself completely to give us a better life, a new start, and a fresh relationship with God. Jesus is less concerned about the method of celebrating communion and more concerned that we celebrate it. Shall we now take our bread? Because it was when Jesus took this, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And we know that he did this so that we could have eternal life. He then took the drink and he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. As often as you drink of this, remember what I have done for you. We know that without the shedding of blood, there can be no transmission for sin. So shall we now just take our, our little bit of bread, eat it, then take the drink, and shall we now do that together? Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you that you, on that first Easter many, many, many years ago, that you were prepared to die for us so that we could live. We thank you, Lord, that on the Easter Sunday you rose to demonstrate that you had conquered the sin, you had conquered death, that you had conquered Satan. And so it is, Lord, that as we look forward to this coming week, that we shall remember and never forget what you have done for us. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we now continue celebrating by singing the final verse of Amazing Grace? The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. Will be forever mine. You are forever mine. Thanks, Lay. John will now continue our teaching series from the Gospel of Mark. Today we look at Mark 5. Thanks, John. Good morning. Well, I've been a sailor for most of my life and my wife Susan and I have been through some pretty horrendously bad situations on our boats, including two cyclones and we've even had one boat totally smashed to pieces in a storm. But fortunately, we've never had to be rescued. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, it doesn't matter a scrap if you turned the radio off or not. The important thing here is that he's being rescued. Now, I don't know, have you ever noticed how some people in really, really important situations tend to worry about, to, to concentrate on, even to obsess over the most trivial and unimportant little things? So much so that to the point that they, they almost lose sight of the really big picture. To paraphrase the words of Jesus, what good will it do a man if he turns his radio off yet forfeits his soul. You see, the man could have gone back and made sure his radio was turned off, but then he might have gone down with the yacht and lost his life. What Jesus actually said was, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Here, Jesus was pointing out the danger of being so obsessed with the, the relatively unimportant little things of everyday life, of worldly life, that we lose sight of the big picture. And we risk losing the free gift of eternal life, which God offers us, which is the big picture. Now, as Len said, we've been looking at Mark chapter 5. And today we're going to look at God's power to restore. And the idea here is that no matter how bad things get, God can fix it. But it's important to realise that we're talking about the big fix, the eternal fix. We're not talking about the short-term little fix, the worldly things, the things that we sometimes worry about. Um, you know, we, we often pray things like, please God, cure my cold. Please God, take away my blindness. Please God, Give me a Lamborghini. You know, it's really sad when people lose their faith and give up on God because they've prayed for these little things and God hasn't answered it the way they expected him to. And these little things are really only going to affect them for a few years. And yet they risk, they run the risk of losing the humongous gift of eternal life that God offers to them. Now, in this chapter... There are three events. There's the man possessed by demons. There's the account of Jairus's daughter and the one of the woman with bleeding. I'm only going to look at one of these today, the first one, the, the account of the man possessed by demons. But if you want to learn more about the other two, we're going to be looking at those on our Bible study on Tuesday. Now, this Bible study is streamed through Zoom. It'll start at four o'clock and we'll start signing in from about quarter to 3.45. Um, if you're not sure how to access that or how to get onto Zoom, you can contact Lynn and I'm sure he'll be happy to, to run you through it. Okay, let's have a look at what Mark says. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. That's Jesus and his apostles. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. 
When Jesus saw, uh, sorry, when the man saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you evil spirit. Now, I've left a few verses out there, but these are pretty well known passages and there's no way that we can read the whole of chapter five and get through a talk about it in 20 minutes. So I'm going to jump over some bits. And there seem to be two lines of thought about this passage. Um, some commentators, the picture on the left there, some commentators say that the man actually was possessed by demons and it was these demons that were controlling his behaviour, that he had no say in it. Other commentators, the picture on the right, suggest that the man might have actually imagined or felt that he was possessed by demons. Some say he might have even had a mental illness which led him to believe this. So they're saying that um, it was this belief that the person had that led him to behave the way he did rather than the actual demons controlling his behaviour. Now, does that matter? Well, I, I tend to take the Bible fairly literally. So I believe the first scenario that there really were demons controlling him. But a, a lot of the Bible is, is, um, uses imagery, uses metaphors. And we've seen that in our study on Revelation. So I'm not going to be particularly dogmatic about this. Um, Susan has talked about Mark using pictures and the, the various um, accounts that we have simply being ways of portraying sin through different pictures. And she asked the question is, is death just a picture of sin? Is sickness just a picture of sin? Is leprosy just a picture of sin? And I guess today we ask the question, are demons just a picture of sin? Well, um, many people like to argue about non-salvation issues such as this. You know, we, we can argue all day about whether these are just pictures or not. One of the short-sightednesses of the scribes and Pharisees was that they obsessed over their own little man-made laws rather than understanding God's picture, big picture for them. So we can concentrate on the little unimportant worldly issues, such as, did I turn the radio off? Was, does sin, um, sin cause sickness? Who sinned, this man or his parents? Is leprosy caused by sin? Was the man really possessed by demons or did he just imagine it? We can concentrate on these unimportant worldly issues or we can concentrate on the important eternal issues. Wait, I can see my rescuer. That's what the man in the being dragged up into the helicopter should have been saying, not can I turn my radio off. Wait, I see my rescuer. The rescuer here is Jesus. Jesus died on the cross to rescue me from my sin so that I might have eternal life with him in heaven. That's the big picture. Now, going on to have a look at what um, Mark continues to say. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus send us among the pigs, um, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out of him and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Well, why did Jesus agree to send the demons into the pigs? I've always wondered that. And I really don't know. And if you wonder that, well, that's one of those questions you can ask Jesus when you get to heaven. But in the meantime, there are two questions I think we need to look at. Firstly, why did the pigs have to die? And secondly, was this the end of the demons? Well, um, looking at the first question, some commentators say that the man needed a sign 
that he had been cured. Now, they say this is particularly true if he was only imagining it or if he had some sort of mental illness. And in that case, it would be particularly important to him to have this sort of sign. And the reality is that we all want signs. When we go to the doctor, we want him to give us antibiotics as a sign that he believes we really are sick. And then we want our nose to stop running as a sign that the antibiotics are working. You see, Thomas wanted to see the holes in Jesus' hands as a sign that it was really him. We want to see our brain scans as a sign that the tumour really has become smaller. Now, it's hard to comment on the old charismatic chestnut of people seeing their legs become the same length without treading on someone's spiritual toes. But the bottom line is that we all want to see signs. Jesus knew this and he said to us, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. He knew that we wanted a sign. He promised it and he gave it to us. And the sign was the empty tomb. So we needed a sign. That's exactly what we got, which is why the gospel writers testified to this so that we can see the sign and so that we can know the truth of what's being said. Mark's gospel is all about giving the signs, the evidence, the proof, the testimony about the death, resurrection and the miracles of Jesus to reassure the Christians during the persecution of Nero that Jesus came to rescue them, to redeem them and to restore them as sons and daughters of God. Now, this gospel testimony, together with the gift of the Holy Spirit, should be the only evidence that we need also. So we don't really need to go looking for other signs. So why did the pigs have to die? They had to die as a sign. So was that the end of the demons? Well, um, maybe. It could have been the end of the demons because we're told in Revelation that God can throw the demons into the abyss and this would essentially be the end of them. Commentators tell us that when the demons pleaded with Jesus to let them go into the pigs, what they were really doing was asking Jesus not to send them into the abyss. And the first reading you see there um, bears witness to that. That comes from Revelation. But by sending them into the pigs, they seem to have been left in circulation. Even if the pigs themselves died, the, the demons didn't die. They were still around. And Jesus tells us in this next reading, when an evil spirit comes out of a man, then it takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go to live there. So Simply driving a demon out of a person is not the end. And if that space is left empty, if it's not filled by God's Holy Spirit, the demon can return and bring its mates with him. With him. Mark goes on. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. And the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. The people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Wouldn't you think that if a man who had come along, who could do these great miracles, who could heal people, who could do the wonderful things that Jesus was able to do, wouldn't you think that they'd want him to stick around? But no, they wanted him to go. Commentators suggest that the reason people wanted Jesus to leave was because he destroyed their pigs. Now, pigs were their livelihood. 
And we can see the same sort of thing happening now with this coronavirus. Not just are we having to suffer social distancing and our lives are restricted and we're not allowed to go out, but some people are losing their livelihoods and are rightly upset about that. But the big picture is that if these things were not in place, they could be losing their lives instead of just their livelihoods. And, you know, I wonder if that's what the people in this account uh, are like. Um, one commentator said that this was actually quite hypocritical because the people were prepared to kill the pigs for food to save them from starvation, but they were not prepared to see the pigs die to save them from spiritual death. I'm sure that there are arguments that could be put forward on both sides here, but the fact remains that the people were more concerned with the worldly physical issues of their livelihood and healing than they were with the eternal spiritual issues that were involved. It's interesting that our government has to intervene to stop us doing the trivial things of meeting together in order to save our lives. And that's not the first time in history. It's the same with seat belts and crash helmets. We're often obsessed with little things and lose track of the big things in life. There's been a lot of attention recently in the media about pedophile priests. This has been going on for quite a time now, and there's a series called Revelation on the ABC. And one of the priests that's been interviewed, who's been, well, he was accused of um, abusing children for a period of over 20 years and, and admitted to it, was asked, can you be forgiven? And his answer was, by God, most certainly. And I guess implied in there is the fact that he accepts that many people won't forgive him. And at an earthly level, doesn't it seem really unfair that this man can be forgiven by God for these horrendous things that he's done? And we do tend to think at this earthly level very often. But the reality is that we are all sinners. It doesn't matter whether you've molested children all your life or you've told a few lies or you deny the existence of God we are all sinners and how great is the God who can redeem the worst of sinners not just you and me but people that we see as the, the really bad sinners they can be redeemed and we also can be redeemed but do we concern ourselves so much with the little things of this world? Do we get bogged down with the little things? Have we turned off the radio that we lose track of what God has done in rescuing us and restoring us through Jesus so that we can be sons and daughters of the Most High God? This is truly amazing. And Laoni is now going to lead us in our closing song. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. And we'll guard each man's dignity and save each man's pride. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. 
All praise to the Father, from whom all things come, and all praise to Christ Jesus, his only Son, and all praise to the Spirit who makes us one, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And so as we come to the end of our time of worship together, let me remind you of our upcoming events for this week. So we've got a Good Friday service starting at 9am and an Easter Sunday service starting at 10am. And if you contact then, he'll show you how to get onto Zoom so that onto YouTube so that you can uh, watch those, participate in them through YouTube. Now let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of this time together. We're so grateful that we can continue to meet in your name and worship you together. Father John has reminded us to focus on the important things. Help us to recognize what is important. And as the days pass that lead us into Good Friday, help us to be grateful for your amazing grace at work in our lives, drawing us closer to yourself and to one another. Help us to demonstrate that amazing grace by the way we love one another, reaching out through phone calls and cards to encourage one another. And so our Father, as we go from this time of worship, May your strength fill each one of us. May your wisdom guide each one of us. May your word speak to each one of us. May your hand guide each one of us. May your way lie before each one of us and your shield protect each one of us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, Go in peace to love and serve the Lord Jesus. Amen.